Peace, peace. What's going on? It's Ali Taj Bay. Special report here tonight. I guess what is it like eight o'clock? So I guess everybody should be home, winding down their day, getting their dinner ready, getting the kids fed, stuff like that. So I figure it's probably a better time to go live. Where I could address more people, and more people can get on and actually view the live and um, utilize the information. So the information I have for you is actually good. Um, a lot of people tend to, you know, want to ask questions when um, I do give a lot. I give a lot of things that are um, that are helpful for you. But then, you know, people expect me to be able to go into depth and, and do a lot of things and um, all this stuff that I, I can't really give my time for freely. Um, but I, I'm going to break it down and get into it. So basically, schools are um, trust. They are operating in trust. Um, they they don't have a trustee. They have a board of trustees. Um, so basically what that means is when you're operating in trust, best believe they are operating, um, they're uh, registered in that state to do um, security transactions. They're registered with the SEC to do security transactions. So everything that you do in there in, in school, and I'm going to clarify something for you real quick. This should help you. For those of you who have student loans who are being harassed, um, being uh, garnished, their, um, what do you call it, your tax refunds are being offset by the treasury, this should help you for that promissory note. Exactly. So I want you to know that I did go in and I studied um, Title 20 of the U U.S. Code. Um, I, and at first I thought that just Title 20 dealt with uh, higher education. It doesn't. It's a particular uh, part. I think it's twenty Title 20 USC Section 1078, I believe. And then they go in letters. It's 1078 and then it has another letter behind it, A, B, D, C, and D like that. Um, what I've come to find out, and this makes sense looking back and thinking about it, is um, the student loan servicer is not the creditor. They are the first person that you saw that popped up and popped up on your credit report and sought to collect from you. But I'm going to put this in perspective, and it, and it totally makes sense because I can go back in my mind and think about everything that I did. And when I read it and I found it, I put my eyes on it in the law. The institutions are empowered by the Secretary of, Secretary of Education to originate loans. They originate the loans, which makes sense because where did you where did you fill out your paperwork at? When you notice, if you remember, or for those who recently just went to school, it might be fresh. You have to put the school's um, the school's ID number, and that's very important. It puts in, so that's because they are originating the loan right there. Think of you when you are getting admitted into college as you being at the dealership. The dealer is originating all the paperwork and he gets a um, origination fee. He gets a loan origination fee, right? So the same thing you're doing with there, this is why the um, those who work in emissions are acting just like car salesmen. Like they're trying to do whatever they can do. And sometimes they do things that are fraudulent and, um, and that comes under um, uh, deceptive practices. Um, the same thing that they're doing. They're acting like schoolsmen because they're probably getting a great commission on it, just like a car salesman does. So um, what they're doing is originating securities. They're getting all your information. Everywhere you go, you realize that they want a copy of your license. In a dealership, it makes sense because you're like, all right, I can see that. They want my license because I'm buying a car and I'm going to drive off the lot with it or travel off the lot, whichever one you want to say. I'm just speaking so that everybody can understand what I'm saying. So, all right, that makes sense. But what you're failing to realize is that the license and any other uh, instrument that you use, um, this so-called government-issued um, uh, instrument, which again, just to go off sideline real quick, it's not a government-issued ID. And that's where it's not fraud because um, that case that says the state may not um, license a right and attach a fee to it. I think that's Murdoch, uh, something versus Murdoch. So they actually aren't doing that. They aren't committing the fraud because 
here here in Florida, I can't speak for everywhere else, but you have to go to the tax collector's office to get your um your driver's license, get your plates, all that. They issue it. They say they're sending it to the state, but of course that that's a lie. Um so even when you're dealing with DMV, DMV is not a government entity. They are a private entity that says they're under contract with the state, but we have yet to see in the contract and when we asked to see it, they said that they can disclose that to us, but you can. Cuz under the OPRA Act, the Open Public Record Request Act is which is for uh when you're um trying to obtain government documents. That's when you would use that. For everybody else, it would be a freedom of information request. So I know I'm going off uh, track a little bit, but I do like to give a lot of information. A lot of people, you know, um, you know, I don't want to keep hitting that top, but a lot of people get really agitated with you that you want to charge for your time. You have to. That there's no way that I can pay my bills, maintain my household, and teach and study um, free of cost. Just think about it, bro. Like ev everywhere you go, man. If you go into a restaurant, you're gonna pay for something. If you go to Best Buy, you want something. You gonna pay for something. You're used to this already. You're used to pulling out your debit card and swiping it. It's the same thing here. It, it's you know, it's a business. Whether that person is or isn't a business, they are selling you services, just like you're doing the public every day. So understand that. But the stuff I'm giving you right now is gold. It's jewels. It's free. You know, nobody asked you for anything. But to get back to it. If the school is a trust, the school is originating the loan, it's fraud when they are saying um, that the Department of Education has loaned, lent you money and you owe them back. So what's funny is if you read the, um, I think this is an Unfair Debt Collection Practices Act, the definition of debt collector is someone who receives a loan or assignment that is in default. Now, this is for everybody who, who might or might not know, because I'm, I'm already in that point already. I've actually, um, my, my loan finally defaulted. I graduated uh, college in 2012. Forever, they just kept giving me forbearance, forbearances and, um, and, and stuff like that. And sometimes they would ask me and sometimes they wouldn't. They'd be like, all right, we're going to take care of that for you. You can't pay at this time. We'll just put in another forbearance or a deferment. So finally, they finally defaulted my loans. My loans um, went to... Um, so again, this is another assignment. I want you to know it was sold. It went back to, uh, not back to it, but it went to the Department of Education. They contacted me and then they started threatening that, you know, if I don't resolve this soon, um, I could have a hearing, I request a hearing, all this stuff. Um, they're going to send it to Treasury Offset so they can start snatching your, your tax returns. So, um, so what's funny is they are a debt collector now. Because the definition of debt collector, look it up for yourself. It's in the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act. You can probably look it up in your state um, st statutes as well because each state has a uh, its own version of federal laws. So you can probably look it up in your federal, um, I mean, your state statutes and it'll be called something similar or different. Um, they are a debt collector. No matter what they want to tell you, that they're the creditor, that they lent you the money, um, as we all know, no one lent anyone any money, not even just so for the fact that there isn't any money, but um, the real reason why they haven't loaned you any money, because this is fraud. And when I teach, you know, I know it's wrong that I assume that all of us are from the street or can relate to the street, but I always speak it in street terms because it makes it so simple and you understand it. If, um, if all of us are at a dice game and, um, and I got the bank. So everybody won all my money and I had no more money in my pocket, but I kept playing. And at the end of the game, I told you that, you know, remember that time when everybody won the whole bank and I kept shooting dice, but I had one. So I won your money and kept playing off of it. That right there would get you a beat down if it wouldn't get you anything else. Right. All right. So for you to go into any establishment, whether it be a car dealership, school loan, uh, mortgage, everything. For you to sign paperwork that said that you will promise to repay something that you never got or haven't got yet is fraud. Because it's just like a transaction. If you were buying some loud, you was buying some bud, you're probably not giving that money up until you get the bud in your hand and you check it out, inspect it, smell it, make sure it's right, it is what it is. Then you're giving the money. 
So why do we sign contracts? And we're not talking about a small amount of money. When you're buying a house, you're talking about 150000 250000 300000 you know, and more in excess. You're buying cars, you're signing contracts for 12000 20000 30000 50000 But you haven't even received the money yet. That you're promising that you will pay back over a certain amount of months, terms, and times, and years. So that is fraud. That right there is fraud for you to... um. And for them to hold you liable to the contract. Because as they say, on the back of your, your retail installment agreement contract that you get from the dealership, it says it. Because I, I was studying the fronts of the this contract, but now I started reading the back because the entire thing is part of that contract. Not only that, what it also says on the contract is that everything that you executed, every every other piece of paper that you signed with along with that like the um the odometer disclosure um the um the promise that we didn't promise you anything else or sold as is all of that total equals the um retail installment agreement i thought it was just the long one so um basically what was the point i was making okay that's what i was saying that they're saying that you already received the money so on the back of these contracts what they're telling us is that we reserve the right to um, sell and assign the this contract until we can receive funding, receive the financing. So they haven't even got the money yet. They're using your contract as um, as a security. They are shopping it to investors and then they sell it on your contract. And there's usually a spot that they leave in there. I think it sometimes it's handwritten and sometimes it is filled in by the micro machine. It'll tell you um, all contracts are not the same. Some will say we we have 30 days to get this contract funded. And if we can't, you have to bring back the car and um, we can return your, your uh, deposit or whatever your trade in. If it's still available, if we haven't sold it, we'll return you back whole. But we will charge uh, 55 cent for each mile that you use and um, all this stuff. And if you fail to bring it back, whatever, whatever. This is in your, your contract. So the proof of the fraud is right there that they didn't have the money at the time that you went in and bought the car. Even when they got on the phone and came back out and said, OK, we got we got the contract funded. Uh, so and so is going to be handling it or whatever, whatever, whatever. It's still a lie. It's still a fraud because they haven't given you the money yet. There have they have to wait until until they actually sell the security. They're going to sell it at discount. Um, whatever the face value is, and that's the total with the, the truth and lending disclosures on it. It adds up all the um, financing interest. It adds up to any down payments, um, total payments, and then it puts it in a box on your far right side. And that is the amount that that contract is worth. But of course, they don't sell it for that entire amount because then it's not valuable to the person buying it. So they will sell that discount and say, look, this guy just bought a car. His interest rate was this, this, and that. He's going to pay over the term of the contract. He will pay, let's say, 6000 in interest. So that's, um, you know, so they'll probably be like, just give me 2000 or 3000 for this contract. Because, again, you're being tricked and psyched out. You're thinking that that car right there that you just bought has a value of what they're saying on paper. That car has already been paid for. They're not trying to really recoup their, their money. They're advanced these cars because, again, it's not about the vehicle. It's about the contracts. The contracts are worth way more than a vehicle. It's about securities. Each uh, dealership, whether they are owned by another entity and that entity deals in securities, or sometimes the, um, the dealership itself deals in securities, but they have to keep it separate by law. That's why when you come in and you're talking to your salesman, you're shaking hands, he'll tell you, all right, we're done with this part. We ran your credit. You're looking good. Makes a copy of your license, all that stuff. And he says, all right, we just got to wait to get you over to finance. The finance is always somewhere across and in another office because that is by um, state law. It, it has to be separate. It can't be in, in one total thing. It has to have a separate office. So that's why it started making sense. Also, the person in finance is also called, um, he's trying to underwrite your um, your contract. He's underwriting. So when he underwrites it, 
and it, it's very um it's funny that um a lot of um a lot of when you're looking for the definition of underwriter it took me a while before I could find it where it was in plain English saying what I wanted it to say. But it someone who deals in um, assesses the risk in securities. That's what an underwriter does. So Im- immediately before they even start, because everybody's going to be denying that what you're saying makes sense. You know, they, that's not make sense. It's not securities. That contract is not worth nothing. But again, this is what I had to understood too. You might be saying it to the wrong person. If you're saying it to the salesman who's selling you the car, he's probably oblivious and kept in the dark. And he just knows that for each car he sells, he gets this kind of commission. You know, he's got the carrot in front of him and he's running. But then there's people behind him pushing buttons in his back that knows exactly what's going on. So it's, you know, when it comes to who knows what we know, what's going on is probably usually someone in finance or accounting is who you want to talk to. The general manager. It's very rare that you're gonna hit the GM. He's a no hit the GM. Um I've actually I I don't know if this was the GM on the phone for sure. I think it was. He even played dumb. He got in a little argument match and I, I start telling him, breaking it down exactly what was what. And he just all denials. He he's not admitting to the fraud. So um yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying. I even went to the CEO because when um when I'm dealing with the servicer, I, I've sent stuff all the way to California to the um, executive offices for Honda. And man, I used to be on the phone with them. We just arguing, they hanging up on me. They like, don't call me no more. I'm writing them. We writing back and forth. Like it, it, it's crazy. I, I've been going ham on a lot of people, even um, Fed loans. Man, I would just call them people every day, man. Every day, every day, every day. I would write them, write them, call them every day. And I was still kind of learning and figuring out what this is. But to get back to the point, schools are trust. They do have a board of trustees. Um, and um, as I went through it and I was told, come in as they can't discuss over the phone or email. And that is true. More more evidence of the fraud because they are not going to put anything in writing that you could use to litigate them for a securities fraud. Because that that's what our claims is. is That's the only claim you really have is securities fraud. Because we're not being um, told or being um, having disclosure that we are entering into a security agreement. And that the notes that we are ex, uh, executing are financial assets that they're taking in. And when I explained this to um, someone on the phone from the, I think the dealership. He is trying to tell me that we don't have an interest, a uh, security interest in that contract. Um, but we actually do because it says it right on the contract. It says that we waive, pledge, and assign all security interests in, I think it says uh, in the vehicle or in the title, title, title vehicle property. It, it might not even say vehicle because it, it's not referring to the vehicle. It's talking about the contract. So if we had if we had to pledge it, pledge our interest, obviously, yes, we had an interest in a financial um, instrument that they're not telling us about. But this is another thing I want to tell you. I just made a post about it, too, but I'm going to turn the camera around real quick and um, just move in on it. Now, this is um, if you can see it because it looks blurry. All right, there it goes. So it's telling you where to send payments to. Send payments to Midline Credit Management, Los Angeles, California, right? So I went in and, and I caught this immediately. I went to the next box. This is the next box. Look at this shit right here. Important contact information. Send disputes, if you're disputing the debt, or an instrument tendered as full satisfaction of a debt. Notice it says instrument. Tendered. So these are words you have to look up. Instrument and tendered. As full satisfaction of a debt. And the address is completely different. See where it has to go? So for those of you who are who, who still use the method of using a um, a negotiable instrument or a promissory note to set up the debt, which I personally, you know, some everyone is going to tell you something different. Um, I said you talked to the GM when you got that coat or Zuzu. How you spell it? You definitely should have talked. Man, I knew nothing about this stuff <laughs> back then. So the stairwell came off. That was an aftermarket stairwell. I put that shit on myself too. 
Uh, but no, nah, I didn't know anything about this shit back then. But this shit right here, see? Two different addresses, Los Angeles. So if you sent in a payment and you sent in an instrument and you sent it here, you're probably not going to get what you want because they're telling you exactly where to send it. So this goes to Michigan and it says you may call it. So when you send it, you want to send it either registered or certified mail, but you definitely want to follow up on it um, to make sure that it's, um, it's properly ledgered to your account. But look at that. They're not hiding it. And then you go over to box number three and it says physical payments for Colorado residents. So I'm not understanding what they're saying, physical payments. But I guess the difference between uh, intangible, which would be an, um, well, no, instrument is still tangible. But yeah, I don't understand what they mean in there. But that right there definitely caught my eye. And I've actually seen this in um, when I had my uh, American Express account. Same type of uh, Same type of information that they had in there. You just got to pay close attention because a lot of times we're trying to send these instruments and we're sending them to the CEO. We're sending them to the dealership. We're sending them all to the wrong people. You're doing the right thing, but you're, doing, you're sending it to the wrong people. So um, so that's what I was saying. So as far as with the the um, the schools being a trust, um, yeah, your, your contract, your promissory note or master promissory note as it's called, funds all your education because you only need to um, sign one I forgot um, what I read on there it says the max amount of money you can receive under one um, promissory note is, is a certain amount so um, you can get multiple loans under one note if you exceed the amount you need you have to sign another note because yeah they're going to sell it some more and they're going to securitize it some more in the definition on the header for this uh, live there's um the hashtag slabs so i want you to know what that means that's um student loan asset back securities slabs um so this alone lets you know but they from what i read too it doesn't apply to um federal loans under the higher education act it applies to private loans only because I, I found a lot of remedy in there when i wanted to apply it i realized it didn't apply um, one thing you're going to notice, and, and I know this from experience, is you might have the right information and it was all good, but if you're applying it to the wrong type of loan or debt, um, they're not going to apply it and they're also not going to tell you where you're in error at. They're just going to say, sorry, couldn't do it. So study is key and um, and error is key. <laughs> You've been dropping heavy dudes lately. Nah, bro. Actually, I, I just got my little... Um, was that applied science degree? Um, it was just a two year degree, but I didn't even want to go to school, man. I know people say it's really arrogant of me, but people don't realize, like I see nowadays, um, it's cool now. It's finally cool to be a nerd. But the thing is, I've been a nerd my whole life. So information and education was always important to me. And um, so it was arrogance in me that I didn't even want to go to school. I was looking like, why do I need to go to school? I was like, I'm pretty smart already. I don't, I don't need school. And I was really adamant about that until society puts this pressure on you. Um, cause you know, I spent a lot of my young life just getting in trouble and being what people would call a fuck up. And, um, I felt I had to redeem myself and people felt I had to redeem myself. They're like, man, you need to make something of yourself, man. You've been just doing a bunch of dumb shit and nobody has faith in you. So, um, also that, and, and another part of the story, you know, I usually don't put a lot of my private life out there, but it was also had a lot to do with a female that I, I was trying to see at that time. And, um, she had, um, she had took the bar and everything. She went to college. Uh, I don't know how many years, but she got her degree and then she went, she passed the bar and she became an attorney and she opened up a firm and she told me flat out, she said, basically, I'm not trying to date a man that doesn't have a college degree. So that, that was part of the pressure and I should have just stuck to my guns because I didn't really want to go to college. I didn't feel I needed it. Um, and now today, knowing what I know, I definitely know I, I didn't need it. But yeah, I went to school. Um, the two years, it's a lot of um, discrimination that goes on in schools. Um, I used to literally see the difference in how it would happen. I, I didn't think it worked like that with with uh, educational intelligence. 
you know, how could you manipulate intelligence? But they literally were manipulating the papers, the grading, everything. There were people who I know who didn't study, who copied off of people who would tell me they didn't study and would take the test. I would take the test. They would score higher than me. And that's when, um, you know, I, I, people said all the time I jumped the gun and he was like, you always saying something's discrimination or somebody discriminated against you. Like sometimes it's probably not that. So sometimes I try to get a benefit of the doubt. So I took it. I told my professor, she said, well, if you really have a problem, you can appeal it to the Dean. I appealed it to the Dean, went to the Dean. I had a meeting with her and it was somebody else. I forgot who the other person was. And presented all my facts, my evidence, my case, had everything lined out. And you already know me. If you know me already, I had everything there, all the paperwork lined it out. Man, uh, do you know that I still lost that appeal? And like my grades weren't even all that great. And even um, there were people all the time getting on the dean's list and the president's list every semester. And I think president's list, you got to have a 4.0 and higher GPA. Man, my GPA was always slipping and I had to get it up towards the end. So I ended up graduating with a 3.0, which um, everybody is like blown away. A lot of people were confessing to me that they only had like a two point something GPA. And I'm just hard on myself. There was times I would get like a B on a test or something. And I literally wanted to cry. (laughs) That's just how hard I am on myself. But um, let me see what you said. It says, because you was worrying about what people think. It took me most of my life to figure that out. Who was the chick bird from so <laughs> Nah, I wish. Nah, oh, I'm trying to think. I don't think you met her because it was like, you know how I kind of lived my life, even though like I was, I was, you know, in the, in the streets, a little bit of dirt going on. I, I tried to live my life on like a real professional level, like a clean level as if I wasn't in the streets. So she was like a very, um, you know, bougie, um, real spiritual type of chick. She was on some other shit. And um, I really didn't bring her around the other part of uh, my life. And I really didn't display that part of life to her. So, yeah, she, she was a real cool chick. Um, really well-traveled. Uh, I've seen some pictures, kept up with her throughout the years. She's traveled to Egypt, Africa. Well, Egypt is in Africa, but different countries in Africa. And she's been all over the place and done a ton of stuff. Um but yeah, it's a it's a because you worry about people. Think. It took me most of my life to figure that out. Yeah, man, you you well rounded now, right? Like you know, it it um it definitely put me on on getting on my shit. Just looking at at you, looking at Rail, looking at um Snell. You know when I when I had got back into the area, like Snell was in college. He had a good job. He had a degree. Um. And seeing y'all doing your thing, you was a supervisor. I think you're still a supervisor. I remember when you took the job at AC Delco. And I remember um, I was trying to get in, but back then, like, I couldn't see it. I work seven days a week now, but AC Delco was like, you you need to, you, you work seven days a week. There is no days off. I was like, man, I'm not working those seven days a week. So, you know, that opportunity passed me by, but you and Dome went and did your thing. So, you know, definitely real proud of you, like mad proud of you. For, for where you at because you know I, I've seen your dark days so a lot of people can't say that they just see now and you know that's all they, they can focus on so when you see like a person is dark and then they light it, it makes a whole big difference in um, you know being as a man to be able to tell another man that you respect him because you know back in the day and it's probably some people still dumb they call it dick ride and it's not it's it's supporting and it's showing love and we should um show love and respect for people and their accomplishments and things they do. So I try to do that as much as I can, you know, not, not obsessively, but definitely let people know I appreciate them and I see what they're doing and, and, and I respect it. You know, you're a family man, you got the same woman, kids are growing up, you got them in school, you know, good values with them. It's good shit right there. Um but I think I covered everything on the schools. For those who want to study, like I said, look in the Title 20. I think it's Title 20, USC 1078, and, and start on that chapter right there and go in there. Everything you're looking for is right there. Just look up uh, loan origination, and it'll show you that um, institutions have the power to originate loans. 
and that's who originates your loan. It all started to school. Like I never even thought to look there because you you had this uh, servicer down your throat looking for money. And then on the heading, they're misleading because first it says Department of Education and then it'll be like Navian or um, what's the other one name? Um, uh, there's a couple of them. I can't remember all of them, but all that. So it, it's mad fraud to it. <laughs> Yo, that's like that meme. It says, um, it says, I'm not going to lie. Some days I, I, I still want to sell drugs or some shit. Uh, yeah, man, I, I wish, I wish that I could still live like that with all the knowledge I got right now. Man, damn. Damn. Um, But yeah, I think that's it right there. I just wanted to cover everything. Just let people look at schools differently because we weren't used to a lot of these terms. Even when I was going to school, you didn't understand trust or trustee or board of trustees and um, beneficiaries. Um, I just shared something um, that should help you relate to it, it, but it's dealing with public trust. But as far as uh, all these so-called courts and all this stuff that you go to politicians that we go and vote for and we like look at them as celebrities and we look up to them, they owe a duty to the public and it's to protect the public trust. And public trust doesn't mean you trust them. Public trust, trust is a entity. An entity usually has um, money in it, assets, and then there's beneficiaries. And when it comes to the public trust, we are the beneficiaries. If you're having a, a hard time comprehending what that means, and I mean no disrespect, but definitely look it up. When you look it up, look up the legal definition of it. Because, you know, this is how we've been, I, I'm, I guess I'm going to say misled, is, of course, when you look in a dictionary, you already know, you might see three to four to five different definitions of that word. And it's just what context is that word being used in. So we learn to use the words um, just in the sense of everyday reading. While someone else who's more knowledgeable is looking at it from a legal perspective and he understands what that word means. So look up beneficiary um, of a trust or beneficiary legal definition and understand what that means. That someone owes you a debt. They owe you a fiduciary duty. They work for you. Um, even though they got it backwards and twisted right now, they threatening people. Whoever says that, um, that like, you know, that, that we work, that they work for us. Like we're looked at it like sovereign citizens or we're, um, like a threat to the status quo, which you would have to understand. We are, if we took back our rightful power and, and I'm not even saying this on a violence, if it's not like an overthrow, like a violent, you know, thing that you have to do. It's just a change in your mindset of knowing who you are, who you are and who they are. You know, all this, this marching stuff and this other crazy stuff, man, that's craziness. You want something to get done. You have to start learning how to um, petition, to petition the courts, put shit in courts. Courts issue injunctions. They issue declaratory relief, compensatory which is somebody compensating you for a loss, um, uh, checks come out of courts. And that would make sense because uh, a court in legal terms means a bank. The judge is literally sitting on a bank. And when you get done with the judge, when he issues something or makes charges against you, where does he send you? To the clerk. So think of it as a huge grocery store. Even when you get to the clerk, what does the clerk say? How may I help you? So hopefully that put a lot in perspective. You know, I'm not going to take all your time and I'm supposed to be cooking dinner. I'm over here starving, but this is how much um, that I love y'all. This is what I do. This is my passion, man. So I love it and I enjoy doing this. So I'm going to go ahead and um, hey, that's what I'm talking about, Lena. Really, really get into this because I say this all the time and I understand it now. I said need to, to keep studying. Definitely need to keep studying. There's there's no end to it. There's no stop. I stop nonstop. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you. all I just got this today. And the funny part, I order books on top of books. I might not even get to read this whole book like never. I do. I open them up from time to time. But this is the stuff that you, you want to be knowing. You busy trying to get more money. You busy trying to get another job. 
This is the shit you need to be doing. Look at this shit. 33 years as IRS insider will show you the secrets to how to engage the IRS and when. So if you got tax liens or they coming after you and saying that you owe $4,000, this and this and that, this and that, this book should help you prove that you don't. So why is it that people don't want to study? The time you're using to go and get another job, you could be studying stuff like this and learn how to keep more of your money. But then when you keep more of your money, you can't go and spend it. You know, you have to um, you have to learn how to invest money and invest money into yourself. And I'm, I'm going to tell you one of the best ways to do that is what I'm doing now. Um, I definitely practice what I preach. You can go and get certifications to even become a tax preparer and pay only maybe 250 maybe less. Maybe less for it. Um, and add value to your life. And now you can go and prepare taxes. That head to toe with Sherilyn with the hair on the leather, a woo, a price. My past, bless my future. That's one thing I can say. You've been reading books since I met you. That's a true story, man. It, it's, I, I say this to people and they try to clown me, but back then I looked at myself like Stringer Bell. You know, when people try to joke, oh man, you wasn't moving it like that. Wasn't moving it like that, but like he, he was more so the brains of it. You know what I mean? Him and um, Avon Barksdale, he was intelligent, but not like Stringer was. And, and that's how I move. You know, so definitely that, that's what I brought to the game. I'm, you know, people play different roles. Some people play the, you know, the muscle. Some people play this. Some people not do this good. Everybody got a part. Everybody can't be a tough guy, you know? So. That's it on that, man. Like I said, I'm going to get into this dinner, man, before I fall out. Um, but thanks for everybody for watching the live, man. Appreciate you for following the updates. Can I ask you a favor? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm on a live video. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, <laughs> All right, go I'll ahead. be right there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I kind of lost my thought on that. But, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and end this video so I can go ahead and uh, get my dinner going, man. Thanks again for everybody for watching the live and keep following the updates, man. Keep studying.